Lynn Hiles Ministries presents That You Might Have Life. He said he didn't send the Son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. So Jesus came that we might have life. The Bible said in him was life, the life was the light of men. The more light you have, the more life you're going to have. So you can have peace was on That's why it's called the gospel of peace. He took your punishment so you could get his peace. He took what you had coming so you could get what he has coming. All around the country and around the world, people just like you are awakening to the good news of Jesus Christ. What God wanted to do was release the kingdom of God in your life until the joy and the peace and the righteousness of the Holy Ghost would so fill your life. I don't want to just make heaven my home. I want to make my home like heaven. And now, here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Thank you for joining us again this week on the program. I trust you've been blessed by the uh, last several months worth of teaching that we've been doing. We're going to, con to continue along the same uh, theme. We've got a few more uh, studies yet to go from my newest book titled The Unforced Rhythms of Grace. If you've not gotten your copy yet, I uh, really strongly urge you to get it. We uh, will probably begin to not advertise it here in not too long. So if you want to get this copy of this book, uh, go to our website at www.lenhouse.com and get your copy of it today. You can get this book via Kindle. You can get it at Amazon.com. You can get your uh, one for your Nook at Noble, Barnes & Noble. Uh, you can get for your iTunes. It's out there in a lot of different ways. So uh, you can get this book, and I believe you'll really be blessed by it. It's blessing people around the world. Uh, there are some churches that are using them in their Bible studies and their Wednesday night uh, prayer groups and their cell groups. Uh, it's blessing people around the world. If you've been watching, I know you've been blessed by it. Uh, let me also just say that we are assessing uh, what uh, television networks that we are going to continue to stay on. So if we are not, if you're watching us uh, and you, uh, we, we go off the air on your particular uh, network, go to our website at www.lenhouse.com and we'll have a listing of all of the stations and times uh, that we are on and where we're on at. So if uh, you happen to see this spot go blank, uh, uh, maybe check for another place for us on your channel guide. Uh, also, uh, you know, uh, if you would just uh, maybe write to us or send a uh, email even to let us know you're watching, where you're watching from, it helps us to make those kinds of decisions. We, uh, we really uh, want to maintain our audience and we, we've been uh, uh, just really blessed and, uh, uh, by the, the support of the people of God and we believe you're able to hear from God and you'll continue to do that. I want to get in the Word this morning. Uh, John chapter 9 is where we began last week. We're going to continue this study probably over the next couple of weeks. What the theme of this book is about is it is about the miracles that Jesus did on the Sabbath day. It is about how they powerfully picture and speak of what will continue to flow from this incredible posture of rest. Once again, to me, the Sabbath day is more than just a day of the week, the book of Colossians chapter 2 says it was actually the Sabbath was fulfilled in Christ. He is our Sabbath day. He is our place of rest. And the reason we have rest is because in Him the work has been finished. When He cried out, it is finished, He gave us a place that we could come uh, in Him where the rest of God would be our portion. That doesn't mean we become spiritual couch potatoes. It just means everything that we now enjoy, everything that we now have is flowing from this, uh, this incredible posture of rest. It's like being in a promised land called rest. What happened was God said, this is a land that flows with milk and honey. We taught that in a previous segment, that the promised land is more than a piece of real estate. It is rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And when you enter into this promised land called Christ, into this promised land called rest, milk and honey flow out. In other words, there is an outflow of a lifestyle. There's an outflow, I believe, of the miraculous. There's an outflow of things that should continue to be in our lives, not from struggle, labor, works, human effort, and religious calisthenics, but from a simple outflow of the truth of what has been finished in Christ. What we're seeing here is miracles. Everything Jesus did was on the Sabbath day. I am convinced that the more we preach Christ and His finished work, the more the, the miraculous we're going to begin to see. 
Now, uh, I, I, because I believe that one of the things that's even addressed in this particular miracle, this is actually uh, titled The Man Born Blind. This is the last chapter of, of my book. And I want to read the text and then we'll get into some more detail. This is from John 9. Uh, John, Saint John chapter 9, verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work, and as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. And the neighbors, therefore, and they which, which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Now let me just, uh, I'm going to deal with some things. There's so much in all of these pictures that I'm not able to exhaust. I really encourage you to get the books because they really deal with much more detail than I'm able to in these 30-minute segments. But the first thing I want you to see is that here's a man that Jesus comes to who was born blind. Uh, he's born blind. I, I, I said this last week on the program, that's not only uh, maybe a physical blindness, but I believe there's a lot of people who are born again that have been born blind. They have been under a religious system that puts a veil over their faces and keeps them blind. As a matter of fact, the writer of the book of Corinthians says, when Moses is read, it puts a veil over our face. So what it does is it keeps us blind to the revelation of what is ours in the new covenant. And so uh, Galatians also, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 1 even, deals with uh, the law is not of faith. Uh, it says that, when the, uh, that we were kept under the law, shut up until faith came. Uh, when you're under the law, it shuts up faith. I believe the reason why people don't receive more of the miraculous is because they've been taught such a sin consciousness that the first thing that hits them that when they walk down a church out, have someone lay hands on them, is the last foul thing I did. Because how many know that the enemy will come to you and many times the enemy will accuse you because he's the accuser of the brethren. And what he accuses you with is he uses an antiquated law of the mosaic system to try to get you to settle out a court, so to speak, and not be able to take what's rightfully yours. If he can keep you blind, uh, he, he can keep you from receiving uh, the miraculous. Uh, you know, even in this chapter, not only do they say this man was born blind, but they, they begin to even, you know, see, this is how absurd re religion is. First of all, it says, uh, who sinned? You know, that's amazing to me. That's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, button, button, who's got the button, who sinned? Did you sin? Did this one sin? You know, we're always looking, we're always on a sin hunt. Now, I'm not suggesting we live any old way you want to, but I am saying to you, sometimes I think we've more, spent more time on a sin hunt than we have on a righteousness hunt. Because the truth of it is, is they not only accuse this man of being a sinner, but on down here, the Pharisees and scribes accuse Jesus of being a sinner because he heals this man on the Sabbath day. And he said, this man is a sinner because he does not keep our rules. He doesn't keep our Sabbath like we think he ought to. And so what they do is they begin to say, even Jesus is a sinner. And then they go on to say, we know now that God heareth not sinners. Well, let me just tell you something. You go over to the book of James. And James says, if there are any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. They'll pray the prayer of faith, anoint him with oil. And if he has committed any sin, it will be forgiven him. I think it is incredible that James would write that right there in the healing scripture. He would say, and if he has committed any sin, it will be forgiven him. Why is that? Because the same uh, payment and the blood of Jesus that secured your salvation is the same payment and blood of Jesus that secured your healing. What he's simply saying is your sin can't stop God from healing you. I think that's a powerful concept. Now, I, I'm going to have somebody that may not like that, but I'm going to have somebody else that's going to get a hold of that and say, you know what, then maybe I am qualified to receive the miracle that I didn't think I could get because I didn't think I was good enough. Can I tell you that's what is happening here is religion would have kept this man blind his whole entire life. But when Jesus comes on the scene, he said, I came Neither this man, look, he, he begins to, he said, neither has this man sinned or his parents. See, my question would be if they're asking Jesus, who sinned? This man or his parents? My question would be, 
when did he sin? If he was born blind, how could this man have sinned? In other words, that's how absurd religion is. In other words, how could he have sinned? What, coming out the birth canal, he had an evil thought or something crazy like that? No, no, we're always pointing back to sin. And let me tell you this, under the old covenant, what happened was we did reap the sin of Adam and we did reap the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. But in my last show, I showed you how Jesus redeemed us from the sour grapes of visiting the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, that Jesus drank the cup of vinegar on Calvary's cross to drink that sour cup so that you and I are not standing in a place any longer where our sin consciousness ought to be what keeps us dominated and, 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 and like this man. He was constantly, uh, the, the neighbor said, is not this the man who begged? I got to tell you, man, back in the days Whenever I was always preached how bad I was and what a sinner I was and what a dirty, rotten scoundrel I was, it made a beggar out of me. When I'd come before God, I couldn't come boldly. I couldn't ask Him in faith, believe, and I came humbly begging God to do something. I'm going to tell you something. This is my Father I'm talking about this morning. And you know what? I don't have to beg Him because it's His good pleasure to give us the kingdom. That's how God enjoys Himself. So whenever I realize I don't have to beg anymore, one of the first things that happens is that Jesus begins to take this spittle and he begins to take this red clay and he begins to mix it together. He takes the clay. Uh, th these are original components, man. This is almost like going back to the original manufacturer. He's making you know, the same God who leaned over the balconies of glory and could gather red clay and hump, lump it together and shape and form his likeness into it and then breathe into it the breath of life where man would become a living soul because the human and the divine had so interfaced and come together uh, in this garden, in this original creation uh, that uh, he would stand up and act like God, think like God, talk like God in so much that God would trust him to name the animals. And he would say to Adam, I'm going to turn the authority over the blue ball called earth to you. And you're going to have dominion as high as a bird can fly and as deep as a fish can swim. I'm going to make you my vice regent in the earth. You are my, uh, if you will, king. You are my representative in the earth. And God so trusted him with that. Can I tell you uh, that, that when man uh, lost that and he, he disconnected the interface and Genesis mystic garden and uh, when he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when he began to partake of that I'm going to tell you darkness began to flood through his understanding he was becoming listen to me he was becoming blind to who he was and the more that blindness came the more there was a disconnect between the spirit realm and the uh, physical realm you know there's so much I could say here because Adam was because he had the best of both worlds he could move in the visible realm and name animals, but at the same time in the evening he could walk with God and call angels by their name. He had access to the visible and to the invisible. He was the connecting place where uh, God and man could meet the human and the divine. He was the central focus where God met with God and man. He lost that. He disconnects and begins to lose his identity. I don't think lost means you can't find him uh, you know, over here in a hay pile. So I think it means he began to lose his identity. He began to lose who he truly was. The image of God was beginning to fade from his, his, his being. But let me tell you something. 4,000 years later uh, in Bethlehem's manger, the human and the divine was reconnected. A virgin womb and a seed of the divine uh, came together. Uh, he was in, in, the, in, in the womb of a virgin, he took a little virgin girl uh, and he took the seed of the invisible divine God and merged those two where the human and the divine came together and it gave birth to Jesus who was both human and divine. He was very God and very man at the same time. He was a human representative of God. He was the firstborn of a brand new species of humanity. He would be what the new creation would look like. And, and can I tell you that on Calvary's cross, he reached up and grabbed a hold of God with one hand. He reached down and grabbed the human family with the other, and he reconnected them where the cross vertically and horizontally crossed. The human and the divine began to become one. 
on once again, and he began to represent what God would be like in the earth again. Can I tell you, I believe that's what's occurring here and what's being pictured, is there is a Sabbath day that's upon us, not just a day of the week, but a finished work of the rest of God where God is restoring us to a revelation of who we were in the original creation. I believe the moment God restores us to our true identity and we begin to remember. I almost want to say things like, let me stir up your remembrance, put you in remember. I, I believe that we are almost like the movie, The Matrix. We are starting to remember who we are. And as we begin to remember who we are, that we're not sinners, we're not in the old creation. And therefore, since we're not, my eyes have been touched by the spittle and by the clay. In other words, Jesus is bringing this man back to a vision and a revelation of who he was in the original creation. And the moment he brings this man back, I believe the moment you and I come back to this revelation of who we were in the original creation, we will walk like God, talk like God, act like God, and conduct business like God. We will be his vice regent, his representatives in the earth. We will be his hand extended. Man, I'm telling you the possibilities of this make me want to shout. If that doesn't set you up for miracles, I don't know what does. But see, you've got all the things that are holding this back are the religious dudes that are standing back saying, this guy did this on the Sabbath, and because he did, uh, you know, he's a sinner as well as this guy. But I want you to know that we are, we, we are beginning to have our conscience purged from this sin mentality. We are beginning to replace this sin consciousness with a righteousness consciousness. We are beginning to replace a revelation of who we thought we were in Adam to a revelation of who I now am in Christ. You know, uh, recently I've been sharing a series that I did uh, back some time ago on having the conscience seared because what's happening here is that Jesus is bringing this man again back to the place where he realizes, I don't have to beg. I'm a son. I'm a child of God. I, I, and the moment your eyes are open, <clears throat> the moment the veil is removed, the moment the scales fall from your eyes, you know, I could even, you know, I'm all over the place here today, but I'm just so full. <clears throat> but, you know, even the apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, he was knocked to the ground in the beginning of his ministry, and he was blinded too. But what he was blind to, he was blind to the, he, the Bible said he was blind for three days and three nights. Now, I, to me, every time I read that kind of terminology, I think three days and three nights, what Paul was blind to or what Saul of Tarsus, this legalist, this religious legalist was blind to the three days and three nights of the person and work of Jesus Christ. He, had, he knew the law. He was, a, he was a candidate. I mean, he was a student of Gamaliel. He was uh, the top of his class. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Philippians list all of his credentials. But he was blind. He was blind for three days and three nights. This is not an accident, ladies and gentlemen. But a man by the name of Ananias, Ananias' name means grace. But when grace came on the scene, it touched the eyes of a Saul of Tarsus and made an apostle Paul out of him. Hallelujah. What do you say, Dr. Huss? I'm trying to tell you that I believe grace is going to touch somebody's eyes today through this program, and you're going to begin to realize, look, if I get a revelation of Jesus Christ and his death, his burial, his resurrection of the finished work of Jesus, it's going to bring me into a Sabbath where I can have my eyes touched with the clay and the spittle that will bring me back to a revelation of who I was in the original creation too. And when Saul of Tarsus got a revelation and grace had touched his eyes, he became the greatest apostle of grace that ever walked the planet. <coughs> I believe those are tremendous things that are yet to take place in the life of believers as we get a true revelation of who we are. I'm telling you, our identity is about to change. Uh, let me just share this with you. I, I, I began to uh, do a, a, a study back some time ago on the seared conscience, and all my life I've always heard this negative. But I want to bring it to you a little bit today from more of a positive spin. It says, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16 and then go, go into chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. It says in verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, 
and received up into glory. Uh, verse number 1, chapter 4, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared <coughs> with a hot iron. Watch this, it's in the context of forbidding to marry and to commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Excuse me. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If you put thou in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus, nourished up unto the words of faith and good doctrine whereunto thou hast received. Uh, my whole life, <coughs> I've only ever heard this preached negative. That what you're going to do, they, they bring it back and they say, what you're going to do uh, is you're going to just sin uh, until you sin away uh, your day of grace. Uh, and you're going to sin until you sear uh, your conscience with a hot iron. And ha you know, they'd hack after they do that to kind of make it really scary. And while that sounded good and it usually got me to the altar, the truth of it is, is that you cannot sin away your day of grace. The truth of it is, is that where sin abounds, grace will superabound. To fall from grace means you left uh, grace and went back up under the law. In the context where Paul talks about uh, falling from grace, he's saying you left grace and you went back up under the law thinking you can be made perfect. So what he's saying here is that, uh, they, that, uh, that the Spirit is speaking expressly. Latter days that some are going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They're going to speak lies <coughs> in hypocrisy. Uh, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This word lies in hypocrisy. Speaking lies is a Greek word, pseudo logos. It literally means to be, speak bogus, fake, or feigned, or first, forced, or phony, pretended, or shammed words about logos. And logos is a word that we use to describe. God or the second person of, of the Trinity. Uh, and so uh, the logos, uh, when we begin to speak bogus pseudo logos, speaking lies and hypocrisy means we're not preaching the truth about Christ. Man, this, and he said, what's going to happen is once you speak lies in hypocrisy, uh, you, you're, you're speaking feigned lies uh, about Christ. You don't preach the truth about Christ. And what happens is, it is in the context of them forbidding to marry, forbidding to eat meats. He's saying, what's going to cause consciences to be seared is not sinning to you, sin away your day of grace, but it's going to be preaching a sin consciousness until what you do is you get people to uh, have a conscience that is seared where they won't draw near to God instead of they, they draw back from God rather than draw near to God. Uh, let me just, uh, you know, uh, we're starting to run out of time, and I hate to break into something uh, this late in the program, uh, but here, here's one of the things that the blood should do. This word to be seared with a hot iron is also a Greek word that means to cauterize. It is the Greek word cauterizo. And what cauterize does, if you know anything about medical or medication, it means to cause, to, to burn and to stop the flow of blood. All of a sudden, when I started seeing a conscience seared, is uh, the spirit just begin to quicken and make alive to me is what's happened is we set under legalism until we stopped the flow of blood to the conscience. And all of a sudden, man, the Lord began to uh, uh, take me to Hebrews 9, uh, verse uh, number 14. <coughs> it says this, or, or verse number, let me let's just begin to read verse, uh, uh, this is Hebrews 9, verse 9. Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood in only meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them, until the times of Reformation. He's talking about the old covenant sacrifices. Couldn't do anything for him that did the service to make you perfect pertaining to your conscience so that that old stuff could not deal with your conscience. But he goes on to say, <coughs> excuse me, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, watch this, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this cause, he's the meter of a New Testament that by the means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which were called might receive 
the promise of eternal inheritance. It goes on to say, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2, For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers once purged, get this, should have had no more conscience of sin. But in the sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins every year. This is Hebrews 10, verse 16. It says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and their minds, I will write them. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now, where a remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, uh, uh, by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart, or, or by the blood of Jesus. And then it goes on to say in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. What are you saying, Dr. House? What I'm saying to you is the, the conscience that's been seared is not somebody who has sinned until God don't deal with them anymore. It's a conscience that has been cauterized and burnt by the, the preaching of legalism and law until it stopped the blood flow to the conscience. You see, what I believe happens in Hebrews 10 is the blood is applied directly to the conscience. Man, we need the blood to begin to flow to our conscience again. Not so we don't feel bad about doing bad things. I want you to hear this today right. See, purging the conscience just doesn't mean we don't feel bad about doing bad things anymore. What it simply means is, is it purges our conscience for what purpose? So that we can draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith so that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, so that we can hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Because what happens is there are seducing spirits in the last days that are trying to draw us away back to legalism, forbidding this, forbidding that, forbidding the other thing. In the context of that, Paul says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then he tells you what godliness is. It's not a bunch of rules. It's God manifest in the flesh. Now, I know that's talking about Jesus, first of all, that Paul's talking there. Uh, it's talking about the Godhead in, in Timothy, but it's also talking about God coming and taking up his abode within us. What is godliness today? It's God taking up his abode, living his life out through us, living his life through us, not by might or by power, but Jesus Christ himself taking up his abode, living his life through us. The purpose of getting this man to move away from a sin consciousness and to purge his conscience and to open his blinded eyes and bring him back to a revelation of who he is in the original creation is not so we don't just feel bad about doing bad things, but so that we will draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Because once you get in the presence of God, you can't act any way you want to. You'll act holy and you'll act righteous because you begin to realize who you are in the original creation. Jesus spit on the ground and made this man see. We're running out of time. Boy, I hate it. But take a moment, call the number on the screen. Take a moment to write to us, sow a seed into the ministry. You can do it by credit card. Uh, you go to the website and do it, but do it today. We appreciate it. God bless you for tuning in. Watch us again next week. The fourth chapter of Hebrews would cause the reader to conclude that the promised land is more than just a piece of real estate. It is faith in Christ and His finished work that brings us into this incredible promised land called rest. It is from the posture of rest that there's a steady outflow of milk and honey. Milk and honey simply represent the good life on every level, both physically and spiritually. Get ready to discover the unforced rhythms of grace.